All right, guys, so uh, today, uh, by the way, uh, if, if this is your first time here, let me take this opportunity to introduce myself. My name is Todd Peterson, and I'm the lead pastor here at this church. And today we're going to continue our study into 2 Samuel. So if, you, if you've never gone into 2 Samuel, you might be slightly lost, but th there's this guy by the name of David, and David has just recently become king, and he's actually becoming a very, very powerful king. But today we're not going to so much focus on David. We're actually going to focus on a neighboring king and a really bad decision that he made, right? And we're going to see why he made such a bad decision. Sorry. <laughs> That's my dad. All right. So, uh, and, and I, I want to kind of preface this with, uh, just so that you guys get kind of my perspective on how important making good decisions are, okay? There's been a lot of talk in our society lately about how, um, you know, certain people groups are oppressed and they don't get the opportunities that other people do. Um, systematic, whenever I hear the word systematic, I just, I kind of like, oh my God. Because systematic is always followed up with this idea that, that some people have, have obstacles that other people don't have. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, it's, it's as if this is like a new revelation in our society today that, there, that life isn't fair. But the funny thing is when I, would be, when I was raised, my parents reminded me repeatedly, life isn't fair. Right, Wesley and I and Clay and, and Luke, we would get into fights, and then we would, and then we'd be like, "Hey, Wesley's being treated better than I did." And you know what my mom and my dad would say? Life isn't fair. Deal with it, right? And so the problem that I have with our society today is that yes, life isn't fair. Yes, we need to fix things, but telling people that the reason why your life is a mess is because of everybody else isn't helping them. Now, I've been a pastor for about 19 years or over 19 years at this point. Before then, I was a counselor. Uh, I'm also a business owner and I'm a landlord. And what all of those things mean is I am intimately involved in the lives of other people. And I'm telling you that the principle that I've noticed is that the greatest thing that affects your life is your own decisions. Whether good things have happened to you or bad things have happened to you, the thing that's going to affect your life the most is the decisions that you make. And so if I as a pastor want to help you, or if I want to help somebody, the best thing that I can do is help somebody to learn how to make good decisions. Because people who tend to have a pretty decent life are usually in the habit of making good decisions. Right? And if something bad happens to them, which it, it can, if it doesn't kill them, usually their life will get worse for a little while, but then they'll make some really good decisions, and then they have a tendency to make life even better than it was before the bad thing happened. Whereas, if you're in the habit of making bad decisions in your life, right, I don't care what good thing happens to you, you're going to mess it up. right? I have seen people who have made... Uh, <laughs> I mean, how many stories have we seen of people who have won the lottery, literally won millions of dollars, and then two years later are worse off than they were before? And money is one of these... Uh, <laughs> if you only have a little bit of money, you can't make that many bad decisions before you have to change, right? But when you got a lot of money, you can make a lot of bad decisions for a long time before the consequences catch up to you. And so what I want to do, what my goal is to help you do, is to learn how to make good decisions. And so the question that I want us to ask today is what are the ingredients that make good decisions? What are the ingredients? Now, I'm not talking about follow through because once you make the decision, then you have to follow through. And that's a whole other you know, conversation. But what are the ingredients to making good decisions? And in order to figure that out, we're going to actually look at how this king made a really bad decision. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 10. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and, and start with a map to kind of uh, 
let you know where we're at in the story here. We kind of come over here. Sorry about that, Gabe. I know I'm putting you to work. Oh, no. All right, so this is Israel, right? This is, uh, David is now king of Israel. Remember, uh, before he was king, he actually, remember when he had to come and rescue his wives, uh, he already uh, uh, conquered this area here, right? Then he, uh, when he became king, he marched into Jerusalem and made that his capital city. Then the, the, the Philistines came over, attacked him. Uh, he beat them back. Then he went back here and then he went to their mother city. And now he's conquered this area, right? So now all of this area is at peace. Then he went to Moab. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Remember when he... Uh, destroyed them, took uh, uh, prisoners of war and, and, and put to death two-thirds of them. So they were at peace with him. And then, and then he went down to Edom. And remember I talked to you about the garrisons. He replaced the garrisons to make sure that they were at peace as well. And finally, um, and what I didn't cover, I kind of skipped over this part, but he actually went up into Syria. <laughs> he went up into Syria and... He uh, established peace up in Syria. Wait, back to this map. This place right here, Ammon, which this is the capital city, he didn't have to fight them because their king was cool with them, right? And so up until now, he's got peace from all around him until uh, 2 Samuel chapter 10. So let's ride through that right now. Starting in verse 1, it says, After this, the king of the Ammonites dies. So the king dies, uh, the king's son becomes king. Verse 2, And David said, I will deal loyally with him. Uh, that's a big deal, right? Because Nahash means serpent. Okay, so it's the same word that's used for Genesis chapter 3, when the serpent messed everything up for Adam and Eve, Right? So David was actually at peace with the serpent, but if for those of us, the king serpent, but for those of us who are um, who are good biblical uh, students, we should go. Okay, something's going to go wrong here, especially with the son of the serpent, right? And David said, "I will deal loyally with Hanun, son of Nachash, as his father dealt loyally with me." So David sent by his uh, sent by his servants to console him. Concerning his father. And David's servants came into the land of the Ammonites. So he said, his dad was good to me. David's very powerful. He could have conquered them. He's like, but I just want peace. So he said, his dad was good to me. I'm going to be, I'm going to go send some people to, to make sure that he knows that we're still at peace. And to send my condolences over the loss of his father. All good so far. Then we get to verse 3. But the princes of the Ammonites said to Hanun, their lord, Do you think because David has sent comforters to you that he is honoring your father? Has not David sent his servants to you to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? So this is the information that they bring to him. Now, the question that we need to ask is, is that good information or is that bad information? It's bad information, right? David really just wanted peace, and he really sent these people to do, you know, something nice. But then these princes tell him, oh, these people must be spies. So he gets some bad information. And one of the things that I want you to think about is what was motivating the princes to give him that bad information? Was there a prince there that wanted him to have a problem with David so that maybe he could be king? Or maybe, maybe they wanted to seem important in the king's eyes, and so they, they gave him this information. Whatever, it was bad information. Now the question is, is what is he going to do with that bad information? Is he going to make a wise decision or a not wise decision? So in verse 4, So Hanun took David's servants and shaved off half of the beard of each and cut off their garments in the middle at their hips and sent them away. So uh, I'm going to give you guys a little um, cartoon image so that you guys can get an idea. <laughs> That's what they look like. All right? So they shaved off half the beard. Now, why did they do that? They were humiliating them. 
Back then, for, for, for those men, their beards were very, very important to them. And so what, what the king, uh, King Hanan, wanted to do is to send them, send them back to David and, and force them to walk through the holy city with their booties hanging out and what else ever might hang out, as well as half of their beard shaved off. And essentially, if you did that to the messengers, you were saying, I'm willing to do it to your king. Now, I would argue that that wasn't a good decision. <laughs> so verse 5. When it was told David that he sent... Uh, uh, when, when it was told David, when, when he was told what happened to his, his people, he sent to meet them. He sent his own servants to meet the servants. For the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Remain at Jericho until your beards have grown, and then return. He, he was not going to have them march into the city being embarrassed. He probably sent them some clothes, and he says, Let your beard grow back. And, then, and so he had mercy on his own people. But now it's time to deal with the king of the Ammonites. Verse 6, When the Ammonites saw that they had become a stench to David... The Ammonites sent and hired the Syrians. Remember the people way up north? Well, those people were still a little sour that David had conquered them. And so uh, they hired the Syrians to come and to help them fight. The Ammonites sent and hired the Syrians of Beth uh, Rahab and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 foot soldiers, and the king of Makkah with uh, 1,000 men and the men of Tob, 12,000 men. So he's ready. He's, he's getting ready for a fight. And so when David heard it, not meaning that he hired the Syrians, meaning heard what happened to his men, he sent Joab, which is the commander of his army, and all the host of the mighty men. We're going to go to fight. Verse 8. And the Ammonites came out of the city, and they drew up in a battle array at the entrance of the gate, and the Syrians of Zobah and Rahab and the men of Tob and Makkah were by themselves in the open country. So go ahead and, and put up the, that again. They came over here to the city. And so the, the people from the city came out to fight. But then all of a sudden, all of these people come in behind them. So now they're sandwiched in. They've got the city and all those people willing to fight them on one side. And then they've got the Syrians coming in behind them. So Joab is now finding himself. And it was a, a brilliant... Uh, military move that they pulled. They didn't know who they were messing with. So verse 9, when Joab saw that the battle was set against him, both in front and in the rear, he chose some of the best men of Israel and arrayed them against the Syrians. Verse 10, the rest of his men he put in charge of Abishai, which is his brother, and he arrayed them against the Ammonites against the city. Now why did he do that? Why did he take the best men and put them against the Syrians? Think about that for a second. Why not distribute the best men so that they, they could fight equally? Well, Joab was a smart man. What was motivating the Ammonites that are standing in front of their city? That was their home. Their wives and children were inside of that city. And so they were going to fight until the death, right? But why were the Syrians there? Because they were paid, right? And so which one of those two people would be easier to break their morale? The people with the money, right? Because it's like, well, is this really worth the money? Eh, I don't think so, right? Joab's a genius. So verse 11 and then he said, if the Syrians are too strong for me, he told to his brother, then you shall help me. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. Verse 12, be of good courage and let us be courageous for our people, for the cities of our God. And may Yahweh do what seems good to him. Verse 12, oh, I'm sorry, verse 13. So Joab and the people who were with him drew near to battle against the Syrians and they fled before him. Now, why would they flee? Well, I want you to think about it. He put his best men on the front line. You don't typically do that. 
you let the people who you kind of want them to die off a little bit in the front line, and you keep your best men for later. But what he did is he put his best men out front, and so here are the Syrians going, and then wave after wave they're getting decimated, and they're looking and it's like, oh, we haven't even gotten past the front line yet, and there's rows and rows of guys behind them. Like, we're, we're never going to win this thing. And so they were like, uh, I think we left the stove on and they noped out of him, right? Not today, not today, right? So what happens to the people in front of the city when they see the backup leaving? Verse uh, 14, And when the Ammonites saw that the Syrians fled, they likewise fled before Abishai and entered the city. So they went back, they entered the city, locked the door. Then Joab returned from fighting against the Ammonites and came to Jerusalem. Now, now, he conquered the Syrians, got them to run away. He got the other ones to run into the city. How come he didn't just take the city then? Well, he didn't know if the Syrians were coming back, right? Like, I, I, I need to get my army out of this precocious situation where we're in between, you know, two different armies. Like, let's get out of here. Let's regroup and rethink about this. What are we going to do now? Verse 15, but when the Syrians saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they gathered themselves together. Why did they gather themselves together? Well, they knew David's going to be mad at us. So what does David have to do? If, if he wants to go attack the Ammonites, first he has to deal with the Syrians. So they start gathering together. Verse 16, that their king um, had that Ezer sent and brought out the Syrians who were beyond the Euphrates. They came to Halam, which is a city we'll show you in a minute, with Shobak, the commander of the army of Hadad Ezer, at their head. So Shobak is their commander. Verse 17. And when it was told David, he gathered all Israel together, crossed the Jordan, came to Halam, and the Syrians arrayed themselves against David and fought with him. So map back up here. We see he came up here to Haram. He fought against them. Verse 18, And the Syrians fled before Israel. And David killed of the Syrians the men of 700 chariots. You know how hard it is to kill people on chariots? Like back then, I mean, now it's easy, but you know, back then, you know, you're just standing there and this chariot's coming at you 40 miles an hour, he's got armor, I mean, it's, it's hard to take him out. They took out 700 of them. It was also hard to kill people on horseback. They killed 40,000 horsemen and wounded Shobak, the commander of their army, so that he died there. So he utterly decimated the Syrians, verse 19. And when all the kings who were the servants of Hadadezer saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they made peace with Israel and became subject to them. So the Syrians were afraid to save the Ammonites anymore. So David has now just solved the problem. And for the next few chapters, they're going to now go after the Ammonites. But uh, I'll give you a little hint. While they're trying to fight the Ammonites, David gets himself in a whole heap of personal trouble. So we're going to be talking about that over the next couple of weeks. Okay? But instead of, again, I don't want you to focus on David. Let's focus on Hanun and this horrible, horrible decision. And I'm going to give you a preview. It's not going to end well for Hanun the king. So why did he make this horrible decision? He got bad information, and then he took that information and he did something very unwise with that information. And so I believe, okay, that if we want to have the ingredients to make good decisions, we need wisdom and accurate information. Those are the two things that you need in order to make a wise decision. 
Now, what does that mean for us today? Well, wisdom is actually kind of the easy part. I'm going to be honest with you. Okay? reason why is because wisdom is found all over Scripture. If you will, young men, if you will take uh, Proverbs and start reading through the, the pages of Proverbs, I guarantee you within a couple months you will be twice as wise as you are today. A hundred percent. Wisdom is actually the easy part. The problem these days is accurate information. We live in a time of uh, the, the information age, right? The problem that I've, I've realized over the last few years is that a lot of that information is false. Or it's half information. Why? Because people have a motivation in the information that they're sharing. I want you to think about. I want you to think about the, the the king. He had those princes that shared with him the information. What was their motivation for saying that David was here to spy out? And and I, and I don't know what the motivation was, but obviously there was something wrong there. And and maybe they believed it. I don't know, but there was something wrong there. And the king was too lazy to figure out if that was accurate information or not. Now, once he had that information, then I think he made a very unwise decision. Even if you believe that David was sending spies there, was really the wise thing to do to humiliate them and to send them back to David? Or was the more wise thing to say, hey, uh, uh, yeah, we're going to send you guys back to David. Let him know that I want to have a meeting with him. I mean, that that probably would have been the wise thing. But at the end of the day, he had inaccurate information and he had and he did not deal with wisdom. And so the thing that I want you to do is I want you to start looking at all information in your life. And I want you to be suspicious. And ask the question, what is the motivation behind the people that are sharing with me this information? I'm going to, for instance, MSNBC and CNN are catering to the Democrat, people who, who typically vote Democrat. Okay? And what are they doing? They are giving them information to make them mad. Because the more mad you get, they they realize the more mad you get, the longer you watch, and the more that they can charge for their advertising. Fox News is designed for the Republicans. And they also are giving you information to make you mad. So that you'll watch longer and so that you will uh, so that they can charge more money for their advertising. Do you think any of them are giving you the full story? No. And at the end of the day, if, if, if you're sitting, and I, you know, it's funny, if, if I would have said this, I, I see a lot of agreement. I think if I would have said this maybe six, seven years ago, people would have gone, ah, Todd, you're a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> but now, now, if there's anybody in here who still thinks I'm crazy for saying that, I have a clip that I want to show you that will change your mind. I am Fox San Antonio's Jessica Headley. And I'm Ryan Wolf. Our greatest responsibility is to serve our Treasure Valley communities, the El Paso, Las Cruces communities, Eastern Iowa communities, Mid Michigan communities. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS 4 News produces. But we are concerned about all the trend that responsible one sided news stories plaguing our country. Plaguing our country. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish these same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false, false news has become, become all too common on social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish these same fake stories without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the community use their platforms to push their own personal lives and an agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 
This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. Uh, this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 I kind of feel like saying, no, you're extremely dangerous to our democracy. And for those of us in here who are conservatives, they're like, yeah, it's a liberal media. That was actually a, a conservative media group. You can't even trust social media anymore. Like, you can't trust your Google searches because Google is throttling things that they don't want you to see and, and making sure you know, to give you information that they want you to see. There's, there's all kinds of that stuff going on. Elon Musk, when he uh, uh, took over Twitter, actually released what's called the Twitter files, all kinds of emails, and come to find out the FBI has been telling Twitter what they are allowed to, to, to uh, promote and what they need to squash. So now the government is included in that. Why do I tell you? I don't, I don't tell you that to freak you out. I'm just saying, look, we don't have accurate information. You can get it, but you have to work for it. You can't, people don't just give it to you, okay? So what does that mean for our, our daily lives? Well, Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 says this. You got it up? up? Uh, no. Did I not put it up there? It's, it should be the last uh, verse. Matthew 10, what? Matthew 10, right here. Yeah. Behold, Jesus says this to the disciples. I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Let me say that again. Be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. I think a lot of times as Christians, we get the innocent as doves thing. But the problem is, is that we don't realize that we are sent out like sheep before the slaughter. Jesus wants us to be wise as serpents. Meaning, we have to think like the people who are trying to manipulate us. But then, instead of being manipulators ourselves, we need to be innocent. That's the challenge. Now, um, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, Making good decisions are really, really important in business, and I've learned this. There's a, there's a, a story that a young, aspiring businessman who's very smart uh, meets with an older, successful businessman, and he says, Hey, I, I really want to have success in business. What's the secret to success in business? And the, uh, the wise old businessman said, Learn to make good decisions. And so the man started to walk away, and then he said, wait, wait a minute. I have a follow-up question. How do you do that? How do you learn how to make good decisions? He says, by making bad decisions. <laughs> right? And I can tell you that as a businessman myself, that's, that's the truth. I've made a lot of bad decisions. And, and the bad decisions that I've made, it was either because I didn't use wisdom... So I've learned to use the wisdom from, from the pages of Scripture in every business decision that I make. But then the other part is getting accurate information. And let me tell you something. That's really hard. I've gone into meetings with what I thought was accurate information and come to find out it was just rumors. And I came out of that meeting with egg on my face and losing all kind of business. I think the more challenging thing as a businessman right now is asking the question, what's the market going to do? Because nobody knows. Like, I don't know what to do with my business in the future because it's so volatile right now. Accurate information is super important to making good decisions. So what does that mean for everybody's life? The two greatest commodities in your life is your time and your heart. Be careful who you give your time to. And be careful who you give your heart to. And when I say time, um, 
I actually believe that time is money. I, I believe that that's a true statement. In that, the majority of us, when we go to work, we are trading time at work, and then they give us money, and then we take that money, and we trade it for somebody else's time so that they can either grow us food, or they can you know, fix our car, or what, whatever it is that we do with our money. I believe that time is actually money, so be careful who you give your money to. Because that represents time that you've already invested. The problem is, is that a lot of us use, we don't use wisdom when it comes to buying. We buy emotionally. For women, I don't worry, I'm going to get to the guys. I believe that if, if a business can get a woman to make this statement, then they, are, they have a 75% chance that, that that woman is going to purchase that item. And here is the statement. Oh, this is cute. I can't tell you how many times I have heard that for dresses, for food, for a car, right? Like they make a decision based on if it's cute. Guys, if they go, now if they just go, this is cool, they're probably not going to buy it. But if they go, oh, this is cool. In six months, he's going to have it, right? Like, that, like that's, that's just what it is. And emo most of us, we buy emotionally. So that's not using our wisdom when it comes to our money. But what about the information? How do we get the information on where it's wise to spend our money? Well, we get most of our information from advertisements. Can we really trust those? I mean, it's not that they're false, but are they really going to give you, the, is the business going to give you the full picture before you spend the money? No. Or if you're investing your money, let's say you're investing your money, and, and this is the one thing that I, that I actually disagree with Dave Ramsey on, is uh, he's big into mutual funds. The problem with mutual funds is, the guy who manages the mutual fund for you, he makes money whether you make money or whether you lose money. So is he, is he really going to give you accurate information? You see what I'm saying? And finally, I think we need to also be careful where we give our money because nowadays, businesses don't just do business for profit. There are a lot of businesses that are trying to accomplish other things with their business. And I will give you the least controversial. This is the one that everybody agrees on. Valenciaga. Is a clothing, um, a, a clothing designer. If you, if you if you haven't heard the story, you can look it up. But basically, they they started from openly promoting like pedophilia. I mean, it was just disgusting. And so you got to be careful who you give your money to. On the other side, uh, be careful who you give your heart to. And out of those two things, I would say that's the more important thing. And I don't mean that just from a romantic point of view. I mean that in, in the friends that you keep. The greatest betrayal of my life was from a friend whom I gave my heart to. And you know what? He had some motivations behind the scene and he was giving me false information because he was trying to manipulate me. Be careful who you give your money to. Be careful who you give your heart to. Thank you.